Welcome back. So in this video, I want to give a really quick high-level intro to how to use Python for uh, engineering, math, scientific computing. Just really kind of quick and dirty, what are the first few commands you need to get under your belt to do simple things like for loops and while loops, making matrices and vectors and multiplying them, and maybe even things like integrating uh, you know, the trajectory of some ordinary differential equation. So um, stuff that you'll definitely use in an engineering math class that um, hopefully I can cover pretty quickly um, just running through this script. So this, uh, this Jupyter Notebook was written by Alan Kaptanoglu uh, to provide this high level intro to Python for the um, kind of intro graduate engineering math class that we're co-teaching. And so I'm just going to kind of walk through it um, and we'll, we'll talk through some of, you'll, you'll basically see some of the, the basic operations and things that you should be able to do uh, in Python. This is by no means extensive. This is not, you know, uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow or anything, you know, more advanced than just, you know, how do you add numbers and build matrices and plot things and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, this is assuming that you have Python installed. So you can do this with something like uh, Anaconda or pip install, or there's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, you know, if you Google how to install Python, you'll find a lot of great resources on how to install Python. Um, and I'm also assuming that you have this kind of Jupyter Notebook uh, environment. So you can fire up a Jupyter Notebook, you can open this Python introduction, and you can follow along if you like. Um, and something, you know, I think Alan and I both think is really important for you to, to recognize is that the indexing in Python starts at zero. So if you have a vector, the, the first element of that vector is that vector of zero. The, so zero index, index is the first element, and then the, you know, one is the second element, two is the third element, and so on and so forth. So that takes a little getting used to if you're used to something like MATLAB where the indexing starts at one. Okay, but you'll get used to it pretty quickly. And Python is a much more powerful language, so I'm also kind of assuming, you know, maybe you want to learn Python, but you have some experience in MATLAB or some other language. Um, Python is an extremely powerful general language. It's an interpreted language, which means it's not pre-compiled, but it's built on a lot of compiled libraries. Um, so there's a lot of really powerful stuff under the hood, and it can do almost anything, but you need to you know, know where to look and which libraries to import into the Python environment to use them. So fortunately, basic math is built in. So um, you know the basic mathematical operations like addition, two plus two, two times two, two divided by two, two minus two times seven is going to do the same order of operations that you think it should. It's going to multiply two times seven first, and then subtract that from two. Similarly, you can put parentheses around things. Two minus two quantity times seven is going to be zero times seven should return zero. And if you didn't put print here, it will do that calculation but it won't print anything to the screen. So you need to print to actually put an output uh, onto the screen. So like for example, if I just did something silly here and I said uh, two plus two and I hit enter, well, I guess in this case it does print. So <laughs> maybe this is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I was wrong. So two plus two does print. Uh, if I did two minus two, times seven, that's zero. But what if I do two plus two after? So here, notice if I put two commands, it'll only print the last command computed, unless I say print, 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 print. Okay, so that's why we're doing that there. Um, but basic math, you know, you don't need to import any libraries and it's kind of exactly how you would expect it to be. Um, multiplication is the asterisk sign, so uh, two times two should give me four. Uh, if I want to do something to the power, that's a little different. It's not 2 caret 3 to get 2 to the power 3. If I wanted 2 to the power 3, I would say 2 star star 3. And that would be 2 to the power 3, which is 8. Okay, so that's another important thing to note here is that something to the power is 2 star star that power. Good. Um, okay. And you can also assign variables uh, like I'm doing down here using the at symbol, so no big deal. Um, you can say a equals two plus two. And again, I'm pretty sure if I just say two, you know, let me see if I can go here and say a equals two plus two and I hit enter, it's not gonna print anything. 
Oh, I may have, uh, let me make sure I did this. It's not going to print anything because it's, it's you know, assigning that information to that variable A and it doesn't think it needs to print anything. And so I have to explicitly say print A to get the output of that, you know, A equals 2 plus 2. And again, if you're, you know, used to MATLAB, normally you'd have to put a semicolon after something to suppress the output so it doesn't output to the screen. Here it's not going to output unless you tell it to print that thing. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of useful. Okay, good. So you can uh, add numbers, multiply numbers, take numbers to the power. You can assign uh, variables equals to mathematical operations. You can do mathematical operations and then assign those to a variable, A. Um, what about for loops and while loops and things like that? Those are super important. So here we're going to write a little loop that counts all of the numbers from 1 to 10. And so uh, the, that, that count is going to be stored in this count equals zero. So we're starting off by initializing this variable to zero. And then we're going to write a for loop for this dummy variable ii in the range of 10. So this is the quick and dirty Python way of saying for ii in the range from 1 to 10 in increments of 1. This literally means for ii in, um, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, I think is what, what that literally means. Um, it's going to count, it's going to add ii to the count. And then it's going to go, you know, for, for all ii in this range from 1 to 10, it's going to add that ii to count. And then at the very end, it's going to print this count. And you'll notice when you do a for loop, you do for ii in range of something, this technically, this for loop doesn't have to be a numeric for loop. It doesn't have to be for k equals 1 to 10. It could be for k in a list of, um, of strings, do things with those strings. Like it's a much more general for loop. It's for ii in any set. Uh, of objects, whether they're numbers or strings or arrays or whatever. And so here, range of 10 just creates a set, probably indexed at 0 because it's Python, so probably 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 dot. Um, and if I wanted to test this, I guess what I would do is I would just say range of 10, and maybe I would say print range of 10. Uh, Maybe I'll say k equals range of 10. Let's hope this works. And then I'll say print k. Okay, so I'm not, it's not going to print them out for me. But essentially, uh, here, I'll do it this way. I'll say um, for ii in range of 10 colon um, print ii. Okay, that's what I want to do. So now I'm going to run that, and it's printing 0 all the way down to 9. Okay, so it's actually only added up the first 9 entries. Um, so, so range 10 gives you a vector from 0 to 9. So 10, uh, so it's a vector of length 10 starting at 0, starting at index 0, going up to, you know, up to, in, up to index 9. Okay, so that's what that ii in range of 10 does. You'll notice when you uh, end a for loop, you put a semicolon there and hit enter, and it automatically indents for you. So it tells you that anything that's indented is going to be part of that for loop. And then when you're done with what that for loop is supposed to be, you don't have to say end for loop or anything like that. You just remove your indentation, and it knows that only everything inside of that indented text is part of that for loop. Okay, so um, let's try this here. Um, so we run this, this code for ii and range 10, add up all of those numbers. Uh, I'm actually pretty sure this is just the sum of the numbers 1 to 9. We could probably do this in our head pretty quickly and come up with, yes, in fact, 1 plus 9 is 10, 2 plus 8 is 10, 3 plus 7 is 10, 4 plus 6 is 10, that's 40, plus the 5 in the middle is 45. This is actually only adding up all of the numbers from, uh, it's adding up the numbers from 9, from 0 to 9, the way I've written it here. If I wanted to add up the numbers from 1 to 10, from 1 to 10, what I would actually do is I would add count plus 1 to each of these, uh, I, sorry, I would add ii plus 1 to all of my counts. So for each of these ii, starting from 0 to 9, I could just add 1 to those to make it from 1 to 10. 
Okay, so again, in Python, because it starts at the index zero, this list is only zero to nine. It has 10 elements, but it's only zero to nine. So if I wanted to add up one to 10, I would just add one to all of those numbers. So I, I plus one plus count, and this should be 55, which is the actual sum of all the numbers from one to 10. 55, good, okay, we already found a bug. We're feeling good about this. And it's because we actually went up here and actually you know, looked at what II in range of 10 outputs. It outputs this list from zero to nine. And so again, if I wanted to add up the numbers from one to 10, I would need to add up II plus one, which is now a list from one to 10. Good, okay, so we can do for loops, we can add things to a counter, we can use this cool range command to just create a big vector right off the bat, that's nice. Um, Similarly, you could do something like uh, subtract numbers until the count is not greater than 10. Um, so that's kind of cool. So you could start with this counter equals count, um, which starts at 55. And um, what's count? Yeah, count is 55. So I could have another variable called counter uh, that starts at 55, and I could subtract one from that counter until counter is not, you know, while the counter is greater than 10, it starts off at 55. So while it's bigger than 10, I subtract one, it'll be 54. Then, you know, it's still bigger than 10, so I subtract another one, it'll be 53. It's still bigger than 10, I subtract another one, it'll be 52. And this will repeat until my counter is not greater than 10. Okay, so it'll probably subtract it down uh, until it is exactly equal to 10. And so I'll run this. Um, and yes, in fact, it does subtract my counter down until it is exactly equal to 10. If I wanted greater than or equal, I would just put greater equal, okay, no big deal. So you can do for loops, you can do while loops, um, all of that is kind of built in. Um, now let's go to, to vectors and arrays. So there are some built-in uh, array and vector classes in Python. You can just create a vector with, you know, square brackets and commas. This will create a vector one, two, three, four. Um, and you know uh, you can access the elements of that vector. The, the tooth element is actually the third element because it's indexed at zero. So for example, you know my vector, let's say it has one, two, three, four. The indexing, this is the zeroth index, the first index, the second index, and the third index. So if I take like my vector, a vector uh, of, of two, that's actually this, you know, that's not the second entry, that's actually the third entry because it starts at zero. Zero, one, two, the a vector of two is going to return, um, you know, that's gonna return the value three. Okay, so you have to really keep um, keep those things in mind here when you're when you're working with these, these Python arrays. Um, I don't use these built-in arrays that much. I use NumPy arrays. So these are really, really powerful. NumPy is the numerical Python library. It is extremely well supported. It's very, very powerful. It's built on super high-end linear algebra um, algorithms. And so generally speaking, in, in my, my Python codes, the first line is import NumPy as NP. And what that does is that imports into the namespace of this uh, everything below here, all of the functionality is NumPy. So um, you know every every command in NumPy is going to be imported into this namespace. And all you and what it means when you say as NP, uh, normally you would have to type NumPy dot ones of four to create a vector of ones. When you import NumPy as NP, you can use the shorthand NP.ones. And so it just makes your, your code a little bit more compact and a little bit shorter. You technically could say import NumPy as asterisks, and it would just bring in all of that namespace and you wouldn't even have to type NP dot, but that's a really kind of dangerous idea. It's almost like defining global variables. It'll just kind of like overwrite anything in your namespace that has the same name as an NP function, a NumPy function. So this is pretty common. Most people do this. They import NumPy as NP, and so everybody uses the shorthand NP dot all of the commands in NumPy in the NumPy package.
And so for example, you know, easy to create a vector of ones and p dot ones of four creates a vector with four ones in it. Um, you can create an NP array of one comma two comma three comma four, just like this, um, this vector here to create a vector. Um, you can create matrices. I actually think this NP array is going to be a row vector um, because it's commas are gonna give me a row vector. And if I wanna build a matrix, it's this, um, you, uh, again, it's an NP array, but it's an array of arrays. So you'll notice that there are two square brackets here. And so what this is doing is it's essentially adding in this first row vector, one, two, three, four, and then this next row vector, five, six, seven, eight. And I hope I'm doing this correctly. I'm gonna copy this code and we're gonna print this just to make sure I'm not telling you something that's wrong. Uh, let me add some code here. So I'm going to import NumPy as NP. I'm gonna create these vectors and I'm just gonna print them out so that we can see kind of what's, uh, what's happening. And maybe I'll add some more lines here. Okay, so I'm gonna do something like print B vector. Okay, so it is in fact a row vector of ones. Uh, if I print, uh, if I print uh, my A vector, it's again gonna be a row vector just like I suspected. And so that makes me think that this A matrix is gonna be a two by four matrix because it's essentially two row vectors stacked on top of each other. Uh, so if I do my A matrix, again, it's this uh, two by four A matrix. And you can do things like get the size of this matrix into a little tuple of numbers, the row size and the column size. Um, you know, for all of this stuff, Python is extremely well documented. So if you just do a quick Google NumPy size of an array, you're gonna find the exact command that spits out the size of this array, really easy stuff. Um, good, so um, I use NumPy arrays pretty often for, uh, for things like this. Um, good. What else? Uh, okay, so matrix vector operations, really important. If you wanna multiply two matrices or you wanna multiply a matrix by a vector, it's not the asterisk sign or a time sign, it's the at sign, this, this, uh, the at sign. And so, um, you know, a matrix times a vector is literally, um, you know, would, would literally be the product of these things. And I'm pretty sure that in this case, it's going to interpret, even though it looked like a row vector, it's going to interpret this as a column vector for the purposes of matrix matrix vector products. And so you'll have to get used to how um, kind of uh, Python, you know, indexes these arrays and what can be multiplied. And if you do this a little bit, you know, if you spend any time writing codes involving matrices and vectors, you'll get really good at making sure the sizes and, and array indices match up. Um, Good, yeah, and so um, this dot shape command is how you access that uh, dimension of these NP objects. So if we do, uh, let's go back up here and we say a matrix dot shape, that should spit out, yes, in fact, this is a two by four matrix. Let's try a vector dot shape. I'm just curious what it says, a vector dot shape. Uh, is a four by a comma. So it's interesting, it's not actually saying that this vector is a row vector or a column vector, it's just saying it's a vector. It has four entries, comma, whatever. And this is actually kind of clever because what it means is that even though when I output, when I printed my A vector, it printed it like it looked like a little row vector, one, two, three, four. If I multiply this A vector by a matrix that's this size, it's going to interpret that uh, as a column vector because that'll be the only shape that would make sense to multiply this by this. And so that's kind of cool that um, you can actually see it's not a four comma one vector or a one comma four vector like you would have in, in some other languages. It literally is a, a vector class. Um, it's, it's something different. Okay, good. Um, what else? Um, okay, if you wanna do an element-wise square, so like um, I want to take every single element of this matrix and square each of them, so this would be a new matrix, one, four, nine, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64. You would similarly do my A matrix star star two. That'll take the, the square, the second power of every single element of that matrix. So it'll do an element-wise operation, which is kinda cool. Um, and you see here actually, yeah, this is the element-wise uh, square here. Uh, 
Good. Um, anything else I want to show you? Um, maybe let me look at this matrix vector product again, because I'm curious uh, what this is going to do. So I think that this should give a two by one uh, vector. So if I do this, my matrix vector product, uh, and maybe I need to print my mat vec product. Okay, and in fact, it is an array of 30 by 70, okay? Because um, if I took a, a four by one vector times this, it's gonna give me a two by one vector out. Again, it's irritating me that it draws these as row vectors. You'll have to get used to that. Um, if I do something like uh, what is mat vec product dot shape, um, it is, again, it's a vector. It's not, it's not a two by one array or a one by two array, it is a vector because it's a, it's a matrix vector product and the output of that is a vector with size two. And of course, you'll have to realize, yes, in fact, if I multiply a two by four matrix by a four vector, I have to get a two vector out, so it's a two vector. Um, but it's not, it's not specifying it as a column vector or a row vector, it's just saying it's a vector. Okay, so you'll have to get used to that. Um, good, what else? Um, so sometimes we're gonna want to integrate things over a time vector. We'll wanna compute a time vector or a space vector, kind of a, a grid of points, you know, uniformly spaced between zero and, and T or A and B or whatever. Uh, and so the command, again, is numpy.lin space. So in gen general, it would be numpy.lin space, but since we've imported numpy as NP, it's NP.lin space. Uh, and so what this does is, um, again, this is all in the comments here. Maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can read this uh, without me scrolling. So this creates a 200 element vector, a 200 dimensional vector um, on the interval minus 100 to 100, again, uniformly spaced. So 200 elements uniformly spaced from minus 100 to 100. That's what lin space is gonna do. Very, very useful. Um, command here. Maybe I'll just um, create a little uh, entry here so we can play around with this. So let's say the time equals np.lin space from minus one to one in increments of 10, or sorry, 10 elements. Uh, let's run that and then let's print the time. So you can see that what this is going to do is it's creating, um, so let's just count one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good, so it, it returns an array with length 10 of points uniformly spaced between negative one and one. And you'll notice that this is, uh, the spacing is a little gnarly, it's like spacing of point two, 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 repeating, you know, two ninths. Uh, if you really wanted this to be an even space, you wouldn't have picked 10 points, you would have picked 11 points. So if I wanted 11 points between here, now I'll get a nice, you know, even spacing of 0 0.2. Minus one, minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and one. And again, uh, there are 11 points spaced 0.2 apart between negative one and one. So this is how you create like a time vector. If I wanted better resolution, I would just say, okay, I want 101 points. Um, and that's gonna give me a big, you know, grid from negative one to one, 101 points. And you'll have to figure out how, if I wanted to specify the DT, you know, you would have to specify like, um, you'd, have, you'd have to kind of build in that DT here uh, to build that number. So, you know, if I wanted something like, um, I know that the length of my interval is two, and I, if I wanted a DT of, you know, 0.01, I would do two divided by 0.01 plus one because I want that to be the spacing. And if I run this, oh, something terrible happened. Um, let's see if I can do this without, no. Uh, okay, so the issue is that if I do two divided by 0.01, it's returning a float. And this entry here can't have uh, a float. It needs an integer. This only is defined for integer divisions. And so I totally killed this code here um, because I was trying to be too clever and try to make this um, a different, a different uh, gradation. So if I wanted this to be in spacing of 0.1, I would need 201 points. 
um, 201 points and that'll work there. I'm pretty sure you can cast your float into an integer using something like the ceiling command or the floor command. Uh, if I do this live, I'm definitely gonna mess this up. I'll try np.floor, because I'm almost sure there's a floor function. Uh, that didn't like that at all. Um, and let's just see what the, you know, a float object cannot be interpreted as an integer. Okay, so even floor is apparently returning something. Let's try np.int of 201, that's fine. So let's see if I can now cast this as an integer. And, and so if I, do, if, if I take a floating point number, like a decimal number, it's not an integer. They're stored in different array, like a different, um, they're, they're stored as different objects in Python. And so this is expecting an integer for the number of points in this, uh, this lin space, this linear space. And so uh, I think if I do something like what I did before, which is, you know, uh, two divided by 0.01, that quantity plus one. Python thinks that this is a floating point number because I took and divided by a floating point number and generically that will have decimal representation even though we know that this has a is exactly 201. It's going to interpret that as 201.00000. And so I'm going to recast that as an integer and hope that I don't break my code. Ah, and it worked. Beautiful, okay, so this is how you would kind of hack that lin space if you wanted exactly spacing a 0.01. You could do it this way, uh, instead of specifying that I want 201 points, you could compute how many points it should have for this spacing of 0.01, but you'd have to take that and recast that as an integer or else you're gonna break your code. So. Python is incredibly powerful, it's incredibly general, uh, and it is actually good that all of these different number types are stored as different objects because there's different algorithms for computing on integers versus floating points and things like that. And in fact, if your code is really expecting an integer, it should throw a flag or something, uh, it should throw an exception if you try to give it something that's not an integer. Like, it doesn't make any sense to have a linear spacing from minus one to one with 1 1.2 points. Like, the, what, what does it mean to have 1.2 points? It doesn't mean anything. So it should, this should crash. This should crash and give you an error, okay? Because it's trying to use a float when it should be getting an integer. And so you gotta work around those things. So it's, it's both nice and a little bit irritating <laughs> that uh, it throws these exceptions when you do something stupid, but uh, you'll get used to how to kind of work around this and be very precise and uptight and, you know, for example, cast these things as integers like I did before. Um, you know, so, so this, this code here. I kind of want to show you how I think on the fly also when I'm, when I'm doing this. Okay, good. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're creating a lin space. Uh, now, you know, 200 elements from time minus 100 to 100. Um, into this the time vector. And then we can do things like compute, uh, you know, t squared times sine of t. That would be, you know, literally t every element squared times sine of t. And this uh, star here, again, is gonna do element by element multiplication. So it's not taking like a, a vector inner product of, of this vector and this vector. What it's doing is it's gonna do an element-wise product of at each element of my time vector squared, it's gonna take that element times each element of my sine of the time vector, okay? Uh, and similarly, t squared is just the time star star two. Good. Um, a couple other things, you know, oftentimes you're gonna to wanna to plot your results. So a big part of scientific computing and engineering math is as you're running your computations, you kinda of wanna plot things as you go. You can debug things. You can understand if things are intuitively working the way you think they can. You can plot your functions and data. And so it's really good to, to get very comfortable with always plotting things fast and uh, and just, just plotting your data and plotting your functions. And so in Python, the matplotlib library, very powerful. You can do almost anything uh, in matplotlib if you know how. So again, you know, Google is your friend. You're gonna wanna be searching how do you do things in matplotlib? How do I plot a three-dimensional function? How do I do a scatter plot? How do I do a waterfall plot? How do I do a surface plot? All of that lives inside matplotlib if you know where to, to find it. And so we're importing from matplotlib, which is a huge package of plotting. We're importing a sub package, pyplot, which is gonna be kind of our basic quick and dirty plots that we're gonna use, things like you know 1D and 2D line plots. We're going to import that as plt, so I don't have to type so much, so I don't have to do like, if I didn't have 
add this line here, if I just said import matplotlib as matplotlib, then I would have to type things like, you know, matplotlib dot pi plot dot figure, and I'm gonna, my fingers are gonna get tired, okay? I need to uh, conserve my energy here. So we're going to import this sub package as plot. And then all I have to do is just say, uh, plt.figure, okay? So it kind of tells these, this environment that anything in this, this pyplot subpackage of matplotlib can be referenced by plt. That, uh, that function. Okay, and so uh, matplotlib, super powerful. And then, um, you know, we can plot functions pretty easily. So we created that the time vector and we created our, um, our, our sine vector, um, sine times t squared was f1 and um, t squared was f2. And so it's really easy to plot these. You literally plot uh, you know, your first component versus your second component. So like t versus f of t. And then you can specify things like what color you want it to be, what line thickness you want it to be. So line width equals two means it's a little bit thicker than normal. It'll be two points uh, or pixels of, of line width. R dash means a solid red curve. Now you can see that this is cyan because I've inverted my color scheme, so this should be red if I flipped it. And K dash dash means a dashed black line. Again, because I inverted my color scheme, it is a dashed white line. So really easy to plot things using matplotlib pyplot. You can do things like add labels, you can add the time label to the x-axis, add the functions label to the y-axis, you can add a legend for f1 and f2, our two functions, and you can add a grid. You can see it's a little faint here, but there is a little faint white grid. Uh, actually, when I move my hands, you can see it better. Uh, and you can do things like add, add titles. And if you don't do plot.show, it won't show any of this up. It'll just create this object in its memory banks, and it's happy to just do that all internally. Again, because Python is a very powerful language, it's, it's, it's kind of default is to compute things in memory and to crank through computations, and it only shows you output when you ask it to show you output, plot.show. Okay, um, and that's kind of what you're going to want to do in general is compute things, build vectors, evaluate functions of vectors, plot those things. Always label your plots uh, or else you're going to get into trouble. Um, you know, like labeling your plots is the best way to look smart in a presentation when you're showing someone preliminary data. Label your axes and then it'll be really easy for, for people to follow along with you. Okay, just a couple last things. Um, systems of equations are really important. So like sometimes we want to solve things like, uh, you know, AX equals B, uh, kind of systems of equations where um, maybe A is a matrix and is known. This is a matrix. Maybe B is a vector and is known. Uh, what if I want to solve for X? We do this all the time. This is like a mainstay of scientific computing and engineering math is how do you solve for this, this x, sorry, solve for x, this x vector that's unknown. So again, we can create NumPy arrays for A and a NumPy array for B, and it's pretty easy to solve for x using this least squares command. So this is inside of a sub package of NumPy called linalg. This linalg is going to be one of your best friends. Linear algebra, like all the linear algebra stuff is in np.linalg, numpy.linalg. And least squares is basically finding the x that solves in a least square sense ax, equal, AX equals b. And so in particular, this x, th th this, uh, sorry, there's some noise behind me. Uh, this, this system doesn't even have to have a solution. There could be b's for which this doesn't have a solution. This will find the x that minimizes ax minus b the two norm. This will find the least square solution. So even if this is not a square matrix A, if it's kind of underdetermined or overdetermined or there are no solutions, it'll find the best solution in a least square sense. So very, very powerful. Um, that's, that's what this is going to do. I kind of want to actually run this uh, up here before um, doing the next thing. So I'm just going to plot all of this. And so you can see, um, you know, this output print ax minus b equals. So you can print a string, and then you can print the uh, the kind of the output. And so we solved for x using this least squares command. 
And notice these underscore, underscore, underscore. That means that this command could output more information. I don't know exactly what more information it would output, but if you put in you know, other variables here, there are other things that this, this function could return, but we only care about the x the solution x, we don't care about what those other three things are. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna check, okay, we solved for x given this a and b. If I plug x back in, if I take a times x minus b, how big is the error in my fit? And that's what I'm printing out here. And so it says a x minus b equals two extremely small numbers, nearly machine precision, 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 15, which is basically saying this x value actually does solve this equation. It is a solution of this equation. And when you plug it in, you get something that's approximately zero because ax minus b equals zero for that x. So this is really good. Um, what other things you can create? Random arrays, which is nice. You can create, uh, again, in NumPy, there is a random function. So you can create a rand n. That means a normally distributed random variable, a Gaussian random. And 100 by 100 means I'm going to create a big 100 by 100 array where every element is a rand n, a, uni a, a, a Gaussian normal distributed random number, a Gaussian random number uh, in rand n. Similarly, I can create a vector of random numbers by only giving it you know, one argument 100, so that's gonna create a 100 vector of rand n's or of normally distributed random variables. I'm pretty sure if I got rid of this n and just did rand, it would give me a uniformly distributed random variable. Um, and you know, if, again, if you Google numpy.random, you'll find all of those all of the, the, the sub-functions inside of, of random, you'll figure out how to use all of this stuff. And again, I can find the least squares of AX equals B for this huge 100 by 100 random matrix and this 100 by one random vector, and similarly solve for, um, here again, very, very small errors because this is a very good fit. Um, Good. Uh, probably the last thing I want to show you is just how to do integration of ordinary differential equations. So um, I've shown you a lot of NumPy, which is very, very powerful. There's also a package called SciPy. And there's multiple numerical integrators in Python. So you're going to want to just Google you know, numerical integrators in Python and, and pick your favorite. Um, SciPy is, a, is similar to NumPy. It's a big package of things that are useful for scientific computing. And in SciPy.integrate, there is this solve IVP, which is, literally stands for solve initial value problem. So if you have an, in, an initial value problem is literally x dot equals f of x, where you specify some initial value, some initial condition, x at time zero is x naught. And so solve IVP will numerically solve this using internal schemes that are pre-coded, like Runge cut a fourth order uh, and things like that. And there's different numerical schemes for stiff ordinary differential equations or all-purpose integrators like uh, Runge cut a fourth order, which is what I usually use. And I'll talk about all of those later in this, um, this series, but good for you to just know that, that you know, solve IVP has that. So similarly, I can create a, a time vector using lin space from time zero to 10, a thousand time points uh, in that interval. We can create an initial condition vector, that's our x naught. And then we can create some ODE right-hand side, literally this, um, this f of x right-hand side is ODE test this function, and it takes in an argument uh, time comma x and it'll spit out, so this is a two-dimensional ordinary differential equation, this is a vector x and a vector f. And so, you know, x1 dot and x2 dot are equal to, you know, x1 dot is x2, because again, the indexing uh, starts at zero, so this is actually my second element, x2, and x2 dot equals this minus lambda uh, x, minus uh, zeta x2, sorry, x1 and x2. So basically this is how you create a right-hand side function that's gonna be the right-hand side of my differential equation. And it's really easy to integrate that using solve IVP. You plug in, so it's expecting a certain set of arguments in a certain order. It's expecting an ODE test, uh, sorry, an ODE function, the right-hand side function, which we defined here. And it expects that function to be a function of t comma x. This particular function doesn't vary in time, but this is a very general integrator that, that could integrate functions that do vary in time. So it's expecting a function of time comma space. 
Uh, even if it doesn't de depend on time, you just say it does and then don't have it depend on time, that's fine. So it's expecting the right-hand side of the ODE, some time span to integrate over, some initial condition, and then what time values, what vector of times to evaluate this trajectory on. And when you run that, you get this output uh, from ODE test solution. Um, you basically get the output um, in this, this dot y vector. And I guess we're doing a dot t because I think we need to like transpose this thing. And then you can plot uh, your trajectory. Again, you can plot you know, the time versus space solution for position and velocity. Um, and you'll get something cool like this. This is the solution of that ordinary differential equation in position and velocity. So really easy to kind of get started coding up differential equations, simulating those differential equations, even if they're nonlinear, this would totally work. And then again, very easy to plot these things uh, using, using matplotlibs pyplot. So you can get started and um, if you just wanted to plot the position, that's also fine here. Um, you would just plot the kind of zero, uh, what is this, rows and columns. Yeah, you just plot the, the, the zero kind of column of this output. And the, the one column would be the velocity. So uh, yeah, so, so x1 is just the, the zeroth column of this. x2 would be the, the ones column of this. And you could plot either of those or both of those. Uh, and you can add legends and labels and all of that stuff. So I hope this gives you kind of a high level intro to how to you know, add numbers, multiply numbers, create vectors, create matrices, multiply them, solve systems of equations. You know, solve differential equations, x dot equals f of x, integrate those, and then plot things. That's not everything. That's a tiny, tiny, minuscule fraction of what you can do in Python, but that's enough to get you started in scientific computing and engineering math, and you'll pick up the rest as you go. Get good at the basics, and when you need things, you'll know how to Google them and piece these things together into much bigger, kind of fancier codes and, and numerical demonstrations. Okay, hope that was helpful, and again, uh, thanks to Alan for putting this great package together. Um, again, you can download this in the, the links to the in the description below. Okay, thank you.